Congratulations to Hope Bible Presbyterian Church on the blessed occasion of your 38th anniversary Thanksgiving. I would like to consider Hope BP Church in the future together with you. Probably not in the way that you would expect. So it's probably going to be a little bit different. But I want to look at the past, at the present, and at the future. So as far as the past is concerned, the very first worship service of Hope BP Church was held in May 1986. After starting in January of that year with monthly Bible studies, people kept saying, I don't have worship service. So in May, we started with the worship service. And at that very first worship service, seven adults and seven children were present in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Leslie Irvine. After we outgrew their living room or their lounge, Hope Church moved to a scout hall on the corner of Regency Road and Markham Avenue. That scout hall has since been demolished and there are homes there now. But that scout hall was very primitive. Uh, there was an outhouse for toilets and there was no heat in winter, no air conditioning in summer. So we didn't stay there very long. And we moved at that point to Kensington Center or Kensington Special School on Scripsers Road in Kensington. That building has since then also been demolished. The property was bought by Pembroke and they have built a new extension there and an overhead bridge to go from the old campus part to the new building. So we see there. And while we were at Kensington Center, which meant every Sunday we had to come early and set up the chairs, but we had at that stage several combined activities with Singaporean Bible Presbyterians. And one day in late December 1992, when the Reverend and Mrs. Timothy Toe were in Adelaide, we were returning from lunch when Mrs. Toe said she wanted to go to a certain place. Now, to get to that place, I made a quick turn, turned into Waddle Street in Fullerton, and stopped outside the building that was for sale. I pointed the building out to Reverend Joe and Mrs. Joe and said, this building is out of our budget. It's too expensive. We can't afford it. The building is too big. You know, but a few hours later, I received a telephone call from Reverend Toe. He said, you know, I've been thinking and I've been praying. Is there any way that we can see that building? Well, arrangements were made and we actually saw the building on Christmas day. The realtor was willing to come and show it to us on Christmas day in 1992. And, uh, we noticed, which we already were aware of, that it was ideal for our use. There was large room for sanctuary. There were small rooms that could be used if we had a Bible camp there. And you know, facilities, even an apartment where pastor could live. So we knew it was good in many ways, but we said, we can't afford it. But then, both Reverend Toe and Reverend Peter Chua, who was always also in Singapore, in Adelaide at that time, they both said, we will help you financially. And uh, we went ahead by faith 
which was a big undertaking to buy a building for $850,000 when we only had about 30 or 40 people coming to Hope Church at the time. But we went ahead by faith and purchased what became known as the Stone Mansion. Now, I think you realize that a number of people who were with us in those early days have gone to glory. I think of people like Reverend Timothy Toe, Mrs. Ivy Toe, whose funeral was this past week. Uh, I think of Reverend James White and his wife, Sylvia. Reverend White spoke at our very first Bible camp and preached regularly for us as well. Then there was Reverend George. I think many of you will remember him, Reverend George Van Buren, and his wife, Nan. They were very faithful. He to Nan first, and then later he took Uncle George, or Reverend George, home to be with him. Then there was also Reverend John McKenzie. And then I should also mention uh, some others. The phones I've mentioned now were all pastors and speakers. But I think of others, such as Sister Sally Law's parents, Mr. I think of Sister Chuck Yo's parents, Uncle and Auntie Wee. Uh, I think of Deacon Chu Tan, Elder Michael Lee's father. Deacon Y. King Wong's father. And then, of course, there was Brother Winston and Sister Christabel Salvaniagam. You know, Brother Winston always had a sermon in his Bible so that if I ever got sick, <coughs> he would be able to step in and preach. And there was one time he had to do that, and I got injured on the Sunday. Somebody tried to rob me. Well, we should also mention, of course, as has been mentioned before, Sister Sally Tain. Now, these are not the only ones. There are others as well. But I think I have mentioned enough to make us grateful for what the Lord has done in providing these people, these speakers, and these members. Now, as I look around, I realize there's only about three or four people of the original 14, seven adults, seven children, that are here today. I know at least one of these 14 has gone to be with the Lord. And I know that at least two of them have moved, either interstate or overseas. For some of them, I have not heard as to where they are today. But one thing I do know, are all 38 years older. Now I realize quite a few of you are less than 38. So, you know, you were not here. You were not even alive. You probably were not even thought of at that particular but for those of us who are older than 38, we remember those early days. And not only do I know that we are 38 years older, I also know that we are 38 years closer to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I would like to look with you at and that's what I would like to talk about. Now we're going to be looking at a lot of Bible verses. So I hope you're good at quickly turning. And remember, the Bible is the only book by which you may know certainly the future. It is the only book that satisfactorily answers the question, where did I come from? Where am I here? Why am I here? And where am I going? I'm not sure who originally said that for the first time. 
but it's certainly worth repeating. The Bible is the only book by which we may know for certain the future. And so after briefly looking at the past history of the church, let's look at the present situation. In Matthew 24 and also 25, this passage is known as the Olivet Discourse. And in there, the Lord Jesus gives an answer to three questions from his disciples. In verse 3, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, first question, when shall these things be? Second question, what shall be the sign of my coming? Third question, what shall be the sign of the end of the world? So it's good for us to remember this, how the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 and 25 answers these questions. And so we need to look at that because there we get the signs of the Lord's coming again. And that deals with the presence of our church. Now, as we look at that, it should give us a good idea of what we are dealing with in the present time. So we're going to be looking at nine different things. The first of these is apostasy. Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceive you. So watch out that you won't be deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and they shall deceive many. And then verses 11 to 12, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And then also verses 23 and 24, then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now the English word apostasy comes from the Greek word apostasia. And it means literally a leaving from a previous standing. It is defection from truth. To give you an example of that, in the Old Testament, it would be, for instance, denying the miracles, such as Jonah, the great fish. You all know that story, I'm sure. Also, it would be denying the miracles performed by Elijah, and Elisha. In the New Testament, it would be, again, denying miracles such as the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the raising of Lazarus. So I don't want to spend any more time on mentioning that, but I do want to note something else. Note the appearance of false Christs and false prophets. Uh, some of these names may not be familiar to you. This is Mary Baker Eddy. Uh, she started the Christian Science. There is uh, Joseph Smith from the Mormons. You know, uh, I might also mention for more recent times, uh, Sun Young Moon, who lived actually till quite recently. He was born in 1920, 1912, of the University or as it is often called, the Moonies. I know he claimed that Jesus died before he finished his work on earth. And that he, Moon, had come to finish the work that Jesus had started. Heresy. We should also note 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, that no man is speaking by any means, for that day shall not come, except the coming of falling away first. Now when he says that no man is speaking by any means, for that day, that day is the day of Christ's return. But that day of Christ's return shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now the falling away is the Greek word apostasia. That's the same word, apostasy. So sadly, even some churches have fallen away from the truth of the Bible. And even some churches deny such basic truths as the virgin birth of Jesus, his miracles, his resurrection from the dead. And that's why I want to give a word of warning again. If you are a foreign student, no, we have some here. But if you're a foreign student and you return home after you complete your studies, you need to be aware of this and watch out if you attend a Bible believing church. And the same applies if you go to work in a country area or if you're transferred from work to another city in Australia. Be aware, watch out, don't be deceived by apostates, by churches that no longer believe the truth of God's word. Instead, follow the words of Jude, which has only one chapter in verses 21 and 22. And I quote, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, Pray to the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So, building up yourselves in your holy faith. This is the Word of God. And as I mentioned, it's the only book that really gives us the answer to all the questions. Now, that's apostasy, the first of the signs. The second one is war. We see that in Matthew 24, verses 6, 7, and 8. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end, says Jesus, is not yet. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famine and pestilences and earthquake in diverse places. Don't worry. Jesus says the end is not yet, but it is the beginning of sorrow. Now keep in mind that the Lord Jesus said this about 2,000 years ago. Therefore, it could be sooner than you expect. Note the wars involving Russia and Ukraine. Notice also Israel and Hamas. By the way, uh, Gaza, that Gaza Strip that is always in the news. In the Bible, it is the Philistine territory. And you know that the Philistines were always at war with the Israelis. So with the Jews. So there's nothing new there. This has been going on for thousands of years. So today it just has a different thing. It's called Hamas. But it used to be the Muslims in that area. So they were always fighting. Well, I don't want to spend more time on that. Thirdly, there is famine, as we see in verse 7. There shall be famines, and famine is the necessary complement of war. Look at Gaza, look at the famine there for the Palestinians who are here. And then, fourthly, pestilence, and that's also mentioned here in verse 7. There shall be famines and pestilences. So, 
war, famine, and serious sickness often go together. I never knew him, but my mother's father died before my parents got married, and he died during the Second World War of something he should not have died from, but it was war. And nothing to do. He died. So I knew my mom's mom, my grandmother, but my grandfather on my mother's side never knew her because of pestilence. And then earthquakes, all right? There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places, various places. And recently there have been several serious earthquakes in different parts of the world. I think of uh, quite recently Taiwan, the eastern part of the country, and then uh, Guinea, Indonesia, they had recently and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but within the past month, there have been at least two earthquakes in South Australia. So that's our area. And this past month, uh, there's also been one earthquake in New South Wales. Now, they're not huge earthquakes that thousands of people have died, but there have been earthquakes. So if you watch the news and are attentive to the news, you would have been aware of them. So we see that. So that is five things we have already looked at. The sixth one, religious persecution in verses 9 and 10. Remember, we're still in Matthew 24. Then shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Religious persecutions are evident in a number of countries around the world, and can be expected to get worse as humanity rejects God more and more openly. I was reading in Wikipedia, and they said, and I quote, in the 20th century, Christians have been persecuted by various groups, by the atheistic states such as the USSR, Russia today, and North Korea, Pukhan for the Koreans. The Christian Missionary Organization, Open Doors UK, that 100 million Christians face persecution. A recent study reported that 75 out of every 100 people killed due to religious hatred were Christian. So this again, religious persecution. And watch out what's happening in Australia because of laws that are being passed or are being considered. We do want to happen here. And then Next, the universal spread of the gospel, which was in the last verse of our scripture reading for, uh, for Matthew. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Before the second coming of Christ, the gospel shall be preached in the entire world. The phrase, the whole world, and similar are used a number of times in the Bible, indicating that this may already have been fulfilled during the Apostle Paul's time. Note Romans chapter 1, verse 8. First, says Paul here, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Many Bible scholars today believe that this has been fulfilled. All the world refers to the Roman world at that time because the gospel has gone out over the airwaves around the world. Organizations like Trans World Radio, you know, broadcasting to all worlds. ELWA, 
nations of the Philippines throughout the country, throughout the Far East. Well, I want to mention two more. The days of Noah, and that's again in Matthew 24, but later, 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was the situation like in the days of Noah? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in him, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then in verse 11, the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So when you look at the news on TV, you will see that there is much evil and much violence on the earth. There's no question there. Just watch. Violence. Evil. And then there are the days of Lot. Now, I don't want to leave days of Lot out, even though it is not in Matthew 24. It is found in Luke 17, verses 28 and 29. And you might ask again, what was the situation in the days of Lot? All right, it was bad. But what happened in the days of Lot? Abraham and Lot had split ways. Abraham said, Lot, if you go that way, I'll go that way. But if you want to go that way, then I'll go this way. So Lot chose the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now the Lord came to Abraham and with the pre-incarnate Lord, there were two angels. Now the angels went the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate God state, and talk to the Lord Jesus Christ. But listen what happened. When the angels got to Sodom and Gomorrah, they were invited by Lot. Come, be my guest. Stay in my house. So, but, according to Genesis 19, before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom compassed the city round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Now, that we may know them is a biblical way of saying something that is not very pleasant that we may know them sexually. So there was homosexuality there. So, and we should note also Jude chapter seven, because the days in which we live are like the days of Lot in Jude seven, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. But it says they gave themselves over to fornication. Now the Greek word he used here is ek pornuo. Ek means out of, like in Exodus, out of, hodos, the way. So it's the way out. But here ek pornuo. Now, if you look at pornuo, there's probably an English word that comes to your mind because it's very close. Pornography. So, that's the same root. Ek pornuo, pornography, porne. All the same general idea there. They gave themselves over to fornication. 
they gave themselves over to pornography, to sexual immorality. So this is seen in the days of Lot. And again, we see that is happening today. So we believe that these events, we've looked at nine very quickly and briefly, you know, that these will precede the second coming of Christ. But we believe these are all with us today. Remember, Jesus spoke 2,000 years ago. So we're 2,000 years closer. 38 years since the whole church started. 2,000 years since the Lord spoke these words. So because of that, we believe that Christ's second coming could be any time. And that brings us then to the future of Hope Church. So what is the future of Hope Church? And what is the future for you and for me? And that's why we come to Titus for our second reading. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly love, we should live, and there we got what we are to do and how we are to live. We should live soberly, we should live righteously, we should live godly in this present world, in the now age. And as we do that, we should look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the word and is used here, blessed hope and glorious appearing. They are not two separate events. The Greek word and that is used here can mean even. So looking for that blessed hope, even, or which is the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So this is what we are to do. We are to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, in this now age, literally. And we are to look for that blessed hope. We are to look for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us know that the Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ knows not an hour of the return to earth. Jesus clearly states in Matthew 24, we're back there again, Verse 36, Jesus said, Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Only his Father knows that date. Now, there have always been people predicting Jesus is coming. And I've heard it happening. When I first came to Australia and just after Hope Church started, there was a Korean preacher by the name of Alan. And he said, Christ is coming back in 1988. And I had a number of Korean students at the Bible College. And uh, they were very worried. I said, don't worry. Nothing to worry about. If Jesus comes, you go up to be with him. So why worry? Oh, okay. Never thought about that. Think about that. Jesus comes. We won't be here anymore. We'll be gone. Up with him forever. We're comfortable with these words, says Paul, writing to the church in Thessalonica. Just wait and see. 1988 came. Nothing happened. False problem. So this Oh, 8th of April, 2024. Oh, oh, they got all excited, people in America, because of the eclipse of the sun. Oh, Jesus coming back the 8th of April. We have contacts in the US. My wife has a son, my brother and sister living there. We have a son living there. I have a sister living there. We have family. We have other people emailing us. Jesus is coming April 8th. 
Well, today is April 26th. Did it happen? No. We know it's a false prophet. If Jesus says he doesn't know, who are we to say that we can predict? My father always says Jesus. All right. So that's why I say the Lord Jesus Christ could return any day. Therefore, be prepared and watch. Now that raises another question. How to be prepared? Now the last time I preached here, I spent a lot of time on that question, answering that. I'm not going to repeat all that. But let me just give you one verse that kind of summarizes everything. John 3, 16. Many of you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess your sins to him. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. I realize that. All have sinned. No exceptions. I'm a sinner. Your pastor is a sinner. Your elders are sinners. Your deacons are sinners. You are sinners. No exception. So be aware. So, Jesus says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He will not perish. He will not go to hell. But he will have everlasting life. I'm going to say now, I'll be able to talk to you afterwards if you'd like to talk no more about this. I'll be happy to talk to you. But you've been informed of the trouble that are going to happen. Sad events that are happening out there. Things will get worse in the future. We looked at nine signs preceding the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth. Please know and be encouraged that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us words of hope and eternal life. Let us remember that we are pilgrims and strangers here on earth. The Old Testament believers, such as Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, my quote here from Hebrews 11, 13, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. The apostle Peter says, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from family lust which war against the soul. Strangers and pilgrims. A pilgrim doesn't stay very long at one place. He gets here for a while, then he moves. And so it is when we have believed on the Lord Jesus. As we read in Luke 21, 36, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. All these terrible things. We can escape them. All these things that shall come stand before the Son of Man because you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. For God has not appointed believers to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And that knowing the time, Romans 13, that now it is my time to awake out of sleep and our salvation is nearer than when we believed. Sure. Every day that we live, our salvation is nearer than the day we believe. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, 1962, 62 years ago. Thank God. What a privilege it's been to have served him for all these years. I've never been sorry I needed God's call. I've never been sorry. I yielded my own. I walked with the master. Grew sweeter each day. I've never been sorry. One step of the way. And you can serve the Lord. You know, all church I know is looking for a pastor. Will any of the young people study God's word and be future pastor? You know, I used to pastor 
many moons ago, Calvary Bible Presbyterian Church in Singapore. Today, the pastor was one of the young people when I was pastoring back around 1980. Maybe God speaks to one of you because we need pastors. You won't be sorry if you yield your life to the Lord. Let me give you one verse from the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that bring many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Good verse to remember. If you are wise, you will shine for the Lord. And may Hope Bible Presbyterian Church and each individual in Hope Bible Presbyterian Church be a shining light, a shining testimony, an example in this community, shining brightly as a beacon of hope and light for the Lord Jesus Christ. In Adelaide. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may indeed hopefuls be a bright and shining testimony, an example to the community, shining brightly as a beacon of hope and light for Jesus Christ here in Adelaide. O oh Lord, guide us, direct us, and bless us. And continue to bless Hope Church.